okay i think the record button is working now yeah so um we looked very briefly at the book of exodus uh, we there are so many things that we could have you know talked about but there was no time uh, so we just looked at some very basic concepts uh, so we'll have to now move into the book of leviticus the book of leviticus is not very popular people don't like it a lot because uh, there are no stories in it but if the book of leviticus was not there uh, the nation of israel would have stopped existing because it's the book of leviticus which explains to them what sacrifices they can do how they can please the lord how they can you know make themselves acceptable to the lord the book of leviticus is very important because that laid the foundation for these israelites to continue living in the presence of a holy god and you know uh, be able to finally enter into the promised land so uh, genesis is generally known as the book of beginnings because it talks about the beginning of many many things you know we touched on that last class uh, then when we come to exodus exodus is called the book of redemption because the people redeemed the people from god redeemed his people from slavery leviticus is called the book of atonement that word atonement means someone paying the price for somebody else's sins so that they can be forgiven so the sins of the people were atoned for by the sacrificial lamb the sacrifices which were done those sacrifices atoned for the people's sins though because of those sacrifices the people's sins were forgiven so leviticus talks a lot about the sacrifices which were performed and um the various steps which the priests the which the levite priests should take in performing the different ceremonies so it's more like a instruction guide book about about sacrifices and what the people should do when they come to the temple it is also a guide book to the levite priests to explain to them all the procedures which they should be following when they are serving in the temple so all these details are mainly found in your book of leviticus so because the focus in this book in this book is upon the sacrifices and the temple procedures i mean of course the temple had not been constructed yet but you know uh, all these things would be done in the tabernacle so all the de the details regarding this are given in the book of leviticus and um, here in this book because of the topic the nature of the topic which is being covered over here the word which is used most often the word which is you know um, used repeated more often than any other word in the book of leviticus it's the word holy holy is that one word which is mentioned more than a hundred times in the book of leviticus because this book is all about a holy god telling his people how they can be sanctified and purified and how they can make themselves acceptable to him so the word holy is mentioned more than 100 times in this book uh, you can guess what the next most uh, repeated word would be it's the word sacrifice the word sacrifice is mentioned um 42 times in this book of leviticus and of course you have the word blood also being mentioned many times the word priest is mentioned many many times because uh, there are so many instructions given to the priests in this book of leviticus uh, so these are the main topics that are dealt with in this particular book uh, so uh, god told the levite priests uh, what they should do during the festivals you know the the israelites were asked to uh, to celebrate certain festivals uh, and they were supposed to uh, perform sacrifices in the morning and in the evening so the procedures for that was given and all these things were done so that uh, one day when jesus comes he can take the place of all these sacrifices 
and you know fulfill once for all uh, the atonement the final act of atonement for us so if you look at all the festivals which the other nations would have had you know they all had their own uh, religious festivals all the surrounding nations including even the egyptians their festivals were just festivals but if you when, but when you look at the feasts which are mentioned in the book of leviticus each of these feasts has a purpose it's actually pointing towards jesus christ if you look at the festivals and feasts of the other nations they are just something that the people are doing in the hope of pleasing the gods you know in the hope of getting their blessings from those gods but when you look at the feasts which are mentioned in the book of leviticus each of these feasts has a significance as the people were celebrating these feasts without even realizing it what they are actually celebrating is what jesus is going to accomplish one day so this is this is a lot of um spiritual significance attached to the feasts which are mentioned in leviticus so the people were not supposed to celebrate these feasts in a very light hearted casual manner this was something that should be done with a lot of reverence in a very sacred and holy manner because these feasts are actually pointing towards what jesus is going to accomplish one day for the people not only of israel but for the, but for the entire world um so this book of leviticus basically is dealing with things which happened during one month you know that one month when they were at the mount sinai uh, so uh, the events which are mentioned in this book of leviticus all those events take place during a span of just about one month um, one month yeah uh, during the time when they were actually um, receiving instructions from god at mount sinai and um, people who say that uh, you know the book of leviticus was not written by moses uh, we have evidence to prove that he wrote it uh, if someone can read out from romans chapter 10 verse 5 where it clearly gives the name of the author of leviticus uh, romans chapter 10 verse 5 For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law the man who does those things shall live by them this verse which is quoted over here the person who does these things will live by them that's actually your leviticus chapter 18 verse 5 so paul is quoting this particular verse over here and he according to him who wrote this verse he very plainly says that Moses wrote it so moses says um, so so paul says moses wrote this in leviticus 18:5 he wrote that the person who does these things will live by them so this is actually proof that moses wrote the book of leviticus um okay just to you know look at the overall structure of the book of leviticus um we can again divide this book also into five sections the first section can be chapters 1 to 7 where you have the five main sacrifices being described okay so chapters 1 to 7 the five main sacrifices which all the people must perform on a regular basis that is uh, explained in great detail in chapters 1 to 7 chapters 8 to 10 is where you have instructions given to the levite priests the instructions are given to Aaron and to his sons on what they should do what they should wear uh, what sacrifices they should perform before entering into the tabernacle all those details are given in chapters 8 to 10 it's mainly the instructions given to the levite priests the third section would be chapters 11 to 15 here you have a detailed list of what is clean and what is unclean okay so this long list given of Uh, animals which are considered as clean and unclean um if you touch what objects you will become unclean uh, uh you know and uh, what are the things which are sacred and should not be touched by people all those details are given uh, so this this uh, section chapters 11 to 15 it focuses more on uh, the clean and the unclean the pure and the ordinary everyday use 
objects, certain things you're not supposed to touch because they are sacred, other everyday objects you can touch. You know, those, those kind of details are given. Chapter 16 maybe can be called a separate section by itself because in chapter 16 is where it talks about the day of atonement. This is that one single day in the entire year when the high priest is allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. Uh, for the rest of the time, uh, you know, the Levite priests will only do their work in the holy place. But nobody will ever enter into the Holy of Holies uh, because you have the Ark of the Covenant placed over there and God's presence dwells over there in that, in that most holy place. So nobody could enter there. But on the Day of Atonement, um, Aaron would, would sacrifice an entire bull just for himself. I mean, imagine, uh, you know, he can't just walk inside the most holy place. It's too risky. It's too dangerous. So he, in fact, very reverentially performs the sacrifices which he is supposed to do before even entering. So in fact, he would uh, uh, sacrifice a bull. He would follow all the procedures which are given. He would prepare himself and then he would enter into the most holy place with the uh, blood of the goat which has been killed and then he would sprinkle that blood on the uh, you know the uh, the ark of the covenant uh, in on the inside you know inside the most holy place uh, so uh, it's the details of of this are not mentioned in our you know in the in in the book of leviticus but generally according to tradition we are told that when Aaron or whoever the high priest is who is serving, when that high priest would go inside the most holy place, they would tie a rope to his leg. Because in case God's anger comes upon him and he falls down dead, who's going to go inside and bring out the dead body? Nobody would have the guts to do that. So they would tie a rope to the leg so that in case there is judgment, at least they can pull out that person you know, from with using the rope. And then there was this special robe which the high priest was supposed to wear. And at the bottom of the robe, near the, the hem, the bottom hem of the robe, you would have uh, a, a decoration of little pomegranates and bells. So you would have one pomegranate, one bell, and one pomegranate and one bell. That would be your hem, the, 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 hem, uh, the, the lower hem of the uh, robe. And this was supposed to represent fruitfulness. The pomegranates represented fruitfulness. On the other hand, the bell represented holiness. So when this high priest would go into the most holy place at one single time in the entire year when he's, when he's allowed to go inside, when he goes inside, as he's moving around doing what he's supposed to do over there, these bells would tinkle. You can hear the tinkling of the bells. And it's basically uh, like as if the priest is reminding, the high priest is reminding God and saying, Lord, I'm coming inside over here covered by your holiness. I'm not coming over here on my own. It's because of the bull sacrifice which I have performed according to the instructions which you gave me. I have prepared myself. And now in your holiness, I'm stepping inside to do this task of you know high priestly duty, which I'm supposed to do. And so... Uh, the people standing outside, um, the people, you know, the, the, the Levite helpers who are there in the holy place, they would be able to hear the tinkling of the bells. Now, for a long amount of time, if there's no noise from inside and there's no tinkling of bells, then you have to understand. Maybe the high priest was killed because, you know, he had not met the requirements uh, which, you know, God has uh, made. So if, if, if that were to happen and there's no sound coming from inside, no tinkling bells, then I suppose they would have to pull the dead person out. So this was not a light-hearted ceremony. The Day of Atonement was something very sacred because on that day, once a year, God would remind himself once again that one day Jesus Christ will be coming to make final atonement for everyone. So based on that, God would accept whatever the high priest is offering over there, you know, in the most holy place. So chapter 16 basically deals with this. Um, 
uh, chapter 17 to 27, I suppose, can be called one single section. Uh, chapter 17 to 27 is uh, where you have um, different laws which are given to live a holy life. So what are all the things that you should do to live a holy life? So you have many, many laws which talk about, you know, uh, not indulging in idolatry. Uh, you have property laws being mentioned. You have uh, laws regarding, um, you know, uh, giving of justice. Uh, you have laws regarding moral life, of course. Um, and in, in chapter 23 is where it talks about the seven feasts, the seven festivals, uh, which the people were supposed to uh, celebrate. Uh, so that's also mentioned in chapter 23. So these are the five sections which you, you find in the book of Leviticus. Um, let's look very briefly at the seven feasts which are mentioned in chapter 23. Like I said, all the feasts which the Israelites performed had significance. They all were pointing towards Jesus Christ. The Passover feast, of course, is very obvious. We know that Jesus became the Passover lamb. Uh, we you know that's explained to us in uh, first Corinthians chapter 5 verses 6 to 8 we are told that Jesus Christ became our Passover lamb so we we know the significance of the Passover feast the second feast which was celebrated by these people uh, the Israelites was the uh, feast of unleavened bread in fact that also is mentioned in first Corinthians 5 verses 6 to 8 so uh, it says over there because Jesus Christ has now become our Passover lamb, we should be living without any leaven in us. That word leaven over there is talking about yeast. Uh, you know, so um, there's nothing wrong with yeast. Uh, it's just a symbol that is being used to represent something else. So, you know, God uses the symbol of the yeast to talk about sin. So, um, um, the people, when they are celebrating the Passover feast and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they are not supposed to mix any yeast in the uh, bread which they prepare, you know, inside the tabernacle uh, to represent the fact that we should be living lives which don't have any yeast. So we can all ask ourselves this question. Is there any yeast inside my heart right now? And I'm, of course, not talking about the yeast which we prepare in our kitchen. I'm talking about the spiritual yeast. Is there any yeast? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 8, you know, Paul says, remember, Jesus Christ has become the Passover lamb. And so now you have an obligation. You are now supposed to live a life which does not have any yeast in it, which does not have any sin in it. You need to be holy because the Passover lamb has made a sacrifice on your behalf. Those things are you know, explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now coming to the next feast which these people celebrated, it was called the Feast of First Fruits. So when the Israelite people celebrated the Feast of First Fruits, that's basically when they would bring the first fruits which they have you know, grown from there. Uh, crops, the, the, their, their trees and their uh, crops, and they would place that before the Lord as an offering, saying, Lord, you promised us this land. Now we have come inside this land and we have been able to grow these crops. You have blessed us with rain. You have provided us with all that is required. And now we were able to produce these first fruits. And now we are coming and presenting it before you to say thank you to you. We are grateful to you for the first fruits which you have given us. And remember, the term is called first fruits, which means many, many, many more fruits are going to come, you know, even as the harvest season continues. So it's like an act of faith. The people are saying, we are coming and giving you this first fruits, O Lord, as an offering and making a, a, a statement saying, we trust you that you're going to continue giving us much more fruit even as the season goes by and also the first fruits is like a act of submission the people are saying lord we are giving you this first fruits we are dedicating it to you as a symbol that in the same way we have dedicated this first fruits the rest of the crop which is going to come later that also is dedicated to you 
yes it is true we will use it for our homes you know we will uh, we will we, we will use it to uh, to sell and you know earn money we will do we will we will use the fruits which come later for other purposes but the fact remains that in the same way the first fruits were dedicated to you the rest of the fruits are also dedicated to you which is basically what we do today with our uh, you know sunday offerings when you're putting that offering amount or that tithe into the offering bag you're not just dedicating that 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 particular amount to god you're basically saying in the same way i'm dedicating this amount the rest of what you're going to give me that also i consider it as dedicated to you so i will use it in the right manner i will use the money in a honorable manner so it is like the first fruits you're giving him the the first portion which was which has come into your hand and you're trusting him and saying in the same way you provided this i know you're going to provide the rest and because i believe in you and i you know trust you i'm right now declaring and saying even all the rest which you're going to give to me that also i consider it as dedicated unto you and i will use it in the right manner so they called it the feast of first fruits today we don't have a feast of tithing but it is something that we are supposed to do in an honorable manner you know when we go to the church and make our offerings um the other feast which they had was the feast of weeks um so this feast was observed 50 days after the feast of first fruits so they would celebrate the feast of first fruits 50 days after that they would celebrate something called the feast of weeks so which means there are basically 50 days in between these two festivals and later when you came up with greek and latin the word for 50 is penta so it began to be called the feast of pentecost so the feast of weeks the greek word for that would be the feast of pentecost but originally it was called the feast of weeks um in what way does the feast of weeks remind us of what jesus did you see after the feast of first fruits um okay let us look at how first fruits you know points towards jesus um first corinthians chapter 15 verses 20 to 23 there paul takes an old testament word he takes this word first fruits from the book of leviticus and he applies it to jesus he says when jesus christ was resurrected it's like as if jesus christ was the first fruits in the same way he got resurrected all the people who follow him who you know who will be who will be coming after they also will be resurrected in the same manner so he takes an old testament concept and he applies it to jesus christ and calls jesus the first fruits so in that sense you can think of jesus christ as being the first fruits and then 50 days after jesus resurrection um you have the feast of weeks taking place at which time you actually have you know um, in the new testament the holy spirit coming down upon the people so i'm not saying that it you know the the exact number of days it matches and all of that but basically there is a kind of significance um in the old testament time they had the feast of first fruits 50 days they would wait and then finally they would have the feast of weeks in the new testament times jesus christ rose up from the dead he rose up victorious and then for for a, you know for for a certain number of days he mixes with them you know and he shows the people that he is alive and that he has risen up and then finally he ascends and he goes away and the people are waiting in the same way in the old testament the people would wait for those 50 days for the next feast to begin here in the new testament time you also see the people waiting for the next event to take place and that event takes place on the day of pentecost so there is a kind of connection so everything that that, uh, that god did in the old testament he was doing it with the new testament in mind almost everything that happens in the old testament is a shadow the shadow is pointing towards what's going to take place in new testament times so the old testament is not something outdated um it is a shadow of all the things that we are experiencing today there's a very direct connection 
which is why in second timothy chapter 3 verse 16 you know uh, paul says all the things which have been mentioned in the old testament in the scriptures it is for your learning it is for you to learn from it is for you to be corrected from you know so there is value in these things which we are doing in the old testament survey class because all these things which were which happened so many centuries ago they are directly connected to the things which are happening today in our own christian lives uh so that's the connection between the first fruits and the and the, and the feast of weeks um the feast of trumpets they generally say uh it could be a pointing towards the you know second coming of jesus christ when when it says everyone would hear the trumpet being you know sounded and then jesus would uh, descend once again uh, so they say the feast of trumpets is probably connected to the second coming of jesus christ so we see that all the feasts of the uh, israelite people they had spiritual significance and they were pointing towards uh, jesus christ now um, maybe we can look at those uh, five sacrifices uh, which are mentioned in you know uh, in your leviticus chapters 1 to 7 uh, because those were every single person who lived in the land of israel was supposed to perform these uh, five sacrifices now if you look at that list um or you know the first seven chapters Mm, two of those sacrifices are compulsory okay so they are compulsory sacrifices the sin offering and the guilt offering those two were compulsory everyone has to perform them uh, you know according to whatever instructions are given so let's look at what these two uh, offerings are actually supposed to mean mm. you know if someone could be kind enough to give me a sip of water it would be a big help <laughs> let's look at what the sin offering uh, talks about now that would actually be in your leviticus chapter 4 yeah where it talks about the sin offering so a person may sometimes commit a sin without actually uh, meaning to do it you no know, accidentally he happens to commit a sin uh, so in such cases the sin offering would have to be given also in the same way um they may break a purification ritual for instance they may touch you know the fungus on the wall you know if that happens then you know you're you're impure and you have to offer a sin offering uh, to to be cleansed or you may accidentally touch uh, some object you know that god has declared as sacred so if that happens again it is a, it's a, it's it's a sin so then you would have to make a sin offering uh, to Uh, you know to be forgiven of that particular sin so sin offering was something that was performed every time a person would commit a sin but they're not doing this deliberately it's just that accidentally they it happened you know unintentionally they 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 happen to do that particular sin guilt offering on the other hand is basically for the offering which you are giving for the sins which you deliberately did you 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 decided in your heart i know god wants me to obey him in this way but i choose to break his commandment and do this sinful thing so the guilt offering is something that you would offer for things that you have done deliberately so sin offering is for unintentional sins which happened accidentally you know you may you, you may accidentally harm somebody you know you're having a fight with a person and then maybe you push that person that person falls and they are very badly hurt so you know sin offering is for unintentional sins which just happened on the spur of the moment on the other hand guilt offering is for those sins which you have deliberately chosen to do by breaking the commandments of god you know uh, it's it's a decision that you make in your heart to to disobey the lord 
for such things the guilt offering would be given so these two were compulsory offerings which the people must perform on a, um, a regular basis the other three sacrifices which are mentioned they all were voluntary so the other three sacrifices the first of them was the burnt offering now you see when were when were when when was when did god give the instructions for all these sacrifices he gave these instructions at the mount sinai but long before mount sinai from the time of abel and cain we see people offering burnt offerings why because the burnt offering is basically saying lord you know like this animal which i am sacrificing i am offering myself completely to you in submission to obey you to uh, to follow you completely in every single way so the burnt offering the main central meaning of the burnt offering was you're saying that i just like this animal which is being given over completely to you completely it's going to be burnt in front of you in the same way i am choosing and saying that i also am completely offering myself to you in submission so right from the time of uh, you know uh, abraham isaac and all that you have burnt offerings being given so this was a voluntary offering god doesn't force anyone to go and make you know offer themselves as a burnt offering it's a personal choice uh, the the person whenever he wishes to make that commitment he goes with the sacrifice to the, to the tabernacle and he performs that sacrifice over there to say lord see just like this animal which has been completely given over to you completely burnt in front of you i also am willing to give myself totally so in romans chapter 12 verse 1 where it says you know i urge you brethren by the mercies of god to offer yourselves as a living sacrifice it's basically talking about the burnt offering in in the case of the old testament on the altar you would be placing an animal the animal would be placed over there but over here in our new testament in romans chapter 12 verse 1 you know paul is saying in the same way the animal was placed on that altar and it was completely burnt up for god i am asking you believers to place yourself on the altar not to be burnt up but to be living sacrifices so on a daily basis you choose to stay on the altar and you know the main um, point which preachers make regarding this is if you put an animal on the altar the animal will try to run away so which means you have to take ropes and tie it to the altar on the other hand the believers are not tied to the altar it's a choice that you make to stay over there you know when it starts burning when the sacrifice starts hurting you want to get down and escape but at that time you are not like an animal you know you have you have been created in the image of god so you think about what you are doing and you choose and say yes even though this is burning even though this is hurting i choose to continue to stay on this altar because i am offering myself in submission to the lord so this burnt offering was a sweet smelling offering to the lord of course all the offerings were sweet smelling sacrifices to the lord but this would have meant a lot to the lord because the person is coming voluntarily this is not one of the compulsory sacrifices and yet the person comes chooses to come and do this on a monthly basis where they are giving this burnt offering to say to the lord i'm submitting myself completely to you you know if they had known the new testament terminology they would have actually said the same just like this animal i am going to be a living sacrifice unto you o lord you know that's the kind of commitment that they would be making when they are doing this particular sacrifice the second kind of uh, voluntary sacrifice was the grain offering this is basically when they you know when they were whenever crops are grown they would bring the crop a small a portion of the crop to the altar to say thank you to the lord and say lord you know you have given me all of these crops and now out of gratitude i am bringing this grain offering to you so the, that would be the grain offerings and then you have another final uh, offering which is called the peace offering now the peace offering was given sometimes to 
to say to say to, to say thank you to the lord sometimes the peace offering was given because a person has taken a vow and you know they have said i will uh, you know um i will dedicate myself to the lord for so many days and i'll spend time you know in his presence during that time instead of doing my everyday jobs you know i'll just spend time uh, at the tabernacle in god's presence you know in spend time in prayer and things like that so the end of the vow they would make they would give a a uh, peace offering so that is the last type so you have, so these are the th five main types of offerings which were given in the old testament and you know if you if you reflect upon it all these five offerings they apply even to us we are also supposed to be living sacrifices just like the burnt offerings grain offering the same way god gives to us we give back to him in the form of tithes and offerings um Uh, how does the peace offering apply to us sometimes we 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 make an offering just to say just, just to thank the lord for something sometimes we may make an offering as a kind of a wow where we are saying lord i am dedicating this amount to you because i have you know decided that you know the, my business is going to be completely devoted to you the way i run this business will be only according to your principles so i am making this offering to you as a kind of a wow where i'm saying oh, whatever i'm whatever i know i'm going to take up whatever venture i'm taking up it's going to be completely only for you and for your purposes or something like that so we in a, in a sense these old testament sacrifices also apply to us but of course we would not do it with animals uh, because no one can substitute for jesus christ so we will not be using animals or anything like that but the spiritual principle which is there in these sacrifices those spiritual principles they apply even to the new testament uh, believers uh we, maybe we can also look at you know leviticus chapter 16 which talks about the day of atonement and um, so in leviticus chapter 16 verses 6 to 10 it talks about how aaron would first you know offer a bull for his own sins you know so he uh, first of all performs that sacrifice for himself so that he can enter into the most holy place um and then it goes on to explain in those in those verses you know leviticus 16 verses 6 to 10 that he takes two goats okay so one goat is offered as a sacrifice for the sins of all the people of israel and so the blood of that goat is what the you know uh, high priest will take inside the most holy place and sprinkle sprinkle it on the ark of the covenant what about the other goat why were two goats used for this particular ceremony the second goat is you know it explains what um, Aaron is supposed to do with the second goat um maybe we can actually read these verses uh, leviticus chapter 16 if someone can read out verses 7 to 10 Leviticus sixteen seven to ten. okay so the second goat is supposed to have some different spiritual significance it says that this goat uh, is it it is to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness it explains over here if you look later on you know in verses 20 21 22 you get a little more detail um maybe we can read out verses 21 and 22 if someone could read out same chapter verses 21 and 22 about the second goat and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of children of israel 
and their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of a goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Uh, yeah. So the first goat which was sacrificed, the sins of the people are placed on that goat, and the goat takes the punishment which should come upon them. So that becomes the sin offering. In the second case of the second goat, again Aaron places his hand, his, it says he, lay, he lays his hands on the head of the second goat, and again all the sins of the people, the wickedness and rebellion of the people is passed on to the goat, but this one is not killed as a sin offering, rather it is taken into the wilderness and left to go free. So the goat just goes wandering away, nobody knows where it has gone, and it has gone carrying all the sins of the people upon it. What is this signifying? It signifies the, the first goat signified the fact that the, the, the sins of the people have been washed. It's a sin offering. And uh, so by the blood of that goat, the sins of the people were washed and cleansed is the spiritual significance. The second goat which is bearing all the sins of the people and which has gone away somewhere and no one can find it anymore. It has gone away. It's like God is saying, I have forgotten what you people did. Not only did I pay for the sin and wash you off it, I have also chosen a second goat, which signifies that it's gone away from you. You know, nobody can find that goat. It's gone somewhere in the wilderness, completely lost. Only if you catch hold of it, will you again remember all the sins which were put upon it. So in a symbolic sense, God is saying, that far your sins have been removed from you. It's like it's been taken away from my presence and I will no longer remember what you did. You are completely forgiven. So uh, these... So, you know, the, the technical terms that are used, the first goat is for the propitiation of sin, where the sin is paid for. The second one is for the remission of sin, where God is saying, you, you know, I cut these sins away from you completely and I will not even connect you to those sins anymore. The next time I look at you, I'll no longer think of you as the person who did that sin. No, the connection between you and that sin is cut off. I will no longer think about you in terms of that sin anymore. You are forgiven to that extent. So that's the, um, the you know, significance of these two goats, which were uh, used for this particular ritual. Um, to briefly touch upon this whole thing about clean and unclean animals, um, a lot of people say that uh, you know, God categorized some animals as clean, and some are unclean for health reasons. So they say all the unclean animals are the ones which are bad for our health, and that is why God said you should not eat them. But this is, this is a defect in that argument, because what happened in the New Testament? In the New Testament, God says you are allowed to eat all animals. So does that mean that when the, when the New Testament started, God stopped caring about the health of his people? So it's not for health reasons that he categorized them into two categories. God still cares about our health. He still wants us to eat only the, you know, the correct kind of meat. So it's not for health reasons that he makes a division between the clean and the unclean animals. We get an idea of what God is trying to say you know, on the rooftop where Peter has that, ex uh, that experience, where God connects this whole idea of unclean and clean animals to the idea of Gentiles and Jews. Very clear connection. Nobody you know, uh, humanly made that connection. God himself said that to Peter. God talks about clean and unclean animals and he connects that idea to the concept of Jews and Gentiles. So in the Old Testament time, when God introduced this idea of clean and unclean animals, he was trying to make a point. Which are the animals which are declared as unclean? It's those animals which are not following the standard pattern. You see, the animals which are supposed to chew grass, uh, you know, which chew the cud, you know, is what it says in the, in, in, in the verse. 
they are all supposed to have a, you know that the hoof of the thing is supposed to be divided um so if the hoof is divided that is a proper vegetarian animal you know on the other hand you have some animals uh, which are vegetarian but the hoof is not divided so they are not following the standard pattern so such animals god says they are unclean he has separated away all the um, all the you know uh, philip yancy when he writes his book he calls them the odd balls the standard ones which follow the pattern they are called clean all the odd balls which are not following the regular pattern they are you know kept in a separate set as unclean why does god have anything against that those animals no not at all no uh, god loves the prawns uh, you know god loves the pigs so it's not that god has got anything against any 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 animal because when god created creation he created all of them and declared and said this is good so all animals are good in his eyes but he was trying to bring out a spiritual meaning he was saying you israelite people have been chosen by me to follow certain standards i am setting the pattern for you i have written five books of the torah to show you what pattern you are supposed to follow so you are following my pattern the rest of the people the other nations are following different patterns so they are unclean but a day will come when they will also come to me and when they come to me i will teach them my ways and then they too will follow the ways of the lord and at that time there will be no unclean and clean because you see now they are all following the same standards which god has set so at that point of time there is no need for any separation any more so this is the spiritual significance which is there behind this whole idea of clean and unclean animals every time the jewish people the israelite people would eat the clean animals and they would avoid all the unclean animals in their mind they are basically saying to themselves yes we are like these clean animals which are following the set pattern which has been set by god we are not like the gentiles who are choosing to live in other ways in different ways we we on the other hand are following the set pattern of the lord and so finally when the time of peter comes and peter is on the rooftop god says now i'm going to start bringing in all the gentiles to myself and they too will be baptized by the holy spirit just like the jewish people and they too will become new you know in their inner man they will be reborn into somebody into a new person and so now those people can no longer be regarded as unclean so from now on you don't have to follow this idea of eating certain foods and avoiding certain foods because that was supposed to signify the separation of the jews and the gentiles and now that the separation is now over you no longer have to follow that food law so god did not introduce the food laws just for the sake of health reasons he had a spiritual reason for introducing this concept all right so um Mm, there is no time how this we could have talked about a few more things but that's okay um if anyone has any questions or doubts um no one has posted anything over here either uh, so if you don't have any doubts or questions you know we can close with a word of prayer let's pray lord we just thank you so much for the spiritual lessons that we could learn from the book of exodus and leviticus lord i pray that you would help us to uh, live sanctified lives we thank you that you reached out to us first and now you're waiting for us to reach out to you to reciprocate from our side and express our devotion to you so we pray oh lord that you would help us to be like those burnt offerings to completely offer ourselves in submission to you so that uh, you may be honored in our lives thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you ma'am